let's go. I'm hot. I'm gonna take off my jacket. That's better. Let's head up. In summer, when there are no leaves, you can see the path a lot better. Right now it's covered up in foliage. There's another set of stairs leading here, which basically connects to the one that I came up. And we're gonna go up this way. Story time! Let me tell you the story of the hermit who lived on the mountainside. Right there behind me is a worship altar. It's a Buddhist worship altar. Nothing fancy. As I mentioned, on top of the mountain there's a temple uh, in which a bunch of monks reside and which gives free lunches every Saturday and Sunday, I want to say, but I'm not exactly sure if it's on both days of the weekend. But at least once, if you manage to hike up to that temple or any other temple in South Korea for that matter, you're bound to get some free, free grub. Many years ago, when we frequented this side of the mountain, there was a hermit. He wasn't a monk, but he did live in seclusion. Since my wife, back then still girlfriend, was the only Korean speaking person in our group, she managed to uh, sit down with the man a few times on a few occasions and uh, ask him a bunch of questions. And the story was that he had done some bad things in his life towards his family. As a result, he was basically uh, alienated by his family and he chose to come and live on the mountain by himself. He lived in huts. I'll show you one here. There's one here and there's another one over just around the corner. But these are the places where he used to come and pray to Buddha. He lived here for a number of years, probably over a good 10 years. Um, he lost all of his teeth because the food that he was eating was based on noodles, which is, you know, dried ramyun. Um, people used to bring him food, and I think he ate only uh, duck, which is the Korean rice cake, uh, noodles, and maybe some vegetables or whatever he could gather in the forest. Koreans are pretty good with uh, finding food in the wilderness. Uh, you know, Korean cuisine includes a lot of uh, roots and uh, a lot of those and mushrooms, a lot of those foods grow on the slopes of mountains. So I'm sure that he was able to find some things, but uh, probably not enough to keep him entirely nour nourished. And so he lost all of his teeth for the most part over the years. And uh, eventually, at one point in time, he, he announced that he was leaving. Uh, he started wearing different garbs. He was wearing uh, monk's clothes which he said were, he was given by the temple who eventually adopted him, I guess, in some form of fashion um, as, a, as a devoted man. And then he, was, he told us that he was promoted in some way and he was moving on a, on a uh, pilgrimage to, to the United States. And I haven't seen him since. So chances are he, he left. Let's go head out that way and I'll show you all the rest of the climbs. There's a very narrow path that leads along the side of the, the face of the mountain here. It's just wide enough for two people to pass. Here's another place of worship. It's like a mini praying temple. Back there, I don't know if you noticed, but there was water coming off the mountain. That's what the monk was pretty much drinking, what the hermit was drinking. You can collect it, the mountain, you know, water, mountain water is relatively clean. And for the most part, that's what temples have to offer as well. Uh, if it's a good set up, well set up temple, they will have tap water, but uh, uh, most temples will also have kind of spring water set up. So 
that's where he used to get his water from. It's still there. So this is where the hermit stayed. This is one of his winter houses. Just a shack wrapped up in uh, plastic. And look at that, this side of the hill is booming. It's a lot busier than the other end. Because like I said, the climbs are a lot easier. They're not as treacherous, they're not as long, and you can climb them relatively quickly. A very remarkable fact, or something that I found find remarkable, is that most of these climbers here are in their middle age. Or older. Koreans love the outdoors. And uh, I think for the most part, Asians try to remain as active as possible. So this, it's not unusual to have, to see, you know, middle-aged people climbing as good or even better than young, a lot of the young people, which are getting fatter and fatter by the year. I don't get it. Here's a good uh, location for setting up a camp here too. It's a good spot to set up a tent if you feel so inclined to do, and I know that a lot of people did in the past. Right behind me is the place where we visited the most. Uh, this face of the climb you just saw, uh, it's swarming with people right now, um, is the harder part, actually. There are no markings on the wall, so I don't remember what the climbs are. But I think those range in uh, anywhere from five, uh, five eight to five, maybe 11, five, 10. On this side, there's a lot more easier climbs, which is what most of us did because we were here very recreationally. I think climbing once a week just doesn't cut it. You gotta come out a lot more to build up the stamina and everything else. This here was one of my favorites right here. <laughs> Another small shrine. This is pretty much the end of the line for the climbing face. Well, this is where the uh, bolted climbs end. Past this point, there's a dog. Hello, dog. This guy looks harmless but he's cautious because I'm probably moving in the direction where he was resting, so give him some space. I've been watching a lot of Caesar Milan lately. The man is a genius with animals. This pup uh, needs some time to, to recognize me. We'll proceed with caution. Friendly enough. Where's your home, bud? He's a nice dog. Is this where he live? Is that where you live? He looks very peaceful. Look at him. 
this is the end of the line. The dog is here and he could probably scamper up all those mountains. So could I technically, but there is no specific path. The walls are bare. As you can see, there is nothing bolted here anymore. For the most part, there is no path here to walk on any longer. It's just me and the dog and the climbers are all on that side because that's where the climbing is at. All these little white pieces of paper That's poo. People say you shouldn't stick out your hand to let the dog smell smell you. And Caesar Merlin might not agree. And there was no reason why I mentioned him because I think he's a hero <laughs> when it comes to dogs. He's amazing. Anyway, uh, but what he does recommend, and I've noticed him do that, the dog needs to smell you. So whether you establish dominance over the dog by being simply present without extending your hand. It's, the reason why it's probably recommended not to extend your hand is because you don't actually know what a dog might do if you don't know the dog. If the dog looks aggressive, sticking out your hand for him to smell might not be a good idea because he might just take a nib out of it instead. But like this guy, I just let him smell me. Um, and uh, I patted him and he was cool with it. And while he was a bit apprehensive about passing me before, now apparently he has no qualms with it. So. Off he trotted. I think he, he's watching the climbers there. Check out this view. I might feel inclined to head up to the top of the mountain, providing that the battery lasts. So maybe uh, I won't be recording all of it the entire trip, but uh, I'll show you glimpses of the view from higher up. And then if I can make it to the top, I will not be in time for lunch, but I'll, I'll be able to take you up to the, the temple that you've seen in a couple of my videos. Now you'll finally have a chance to see. I'm not promising anything though. So go say you. Have fun. <laughs> Those were the days, careless existence in a brand new foreign land, nothing to, nothing to worry about. We'd come out here and just spent the whole Saturday just hanging out with good friends and fantastic climbing, half starving. Some of us would bring sandwiches, some of us didn't. Whatever food we had, we'd share, we'd make new acquaintances. We were introduced to the art of, to the Korean art of climbing and drinking soju. <laughs> May have been just one person that we encountered, but uh, on a couple of occasions, the hermit I mentioned earlier, he did bring us a bottle of soju in a very generous and, uh, you know, compassionate way. Uh, but nonetheless, none of us thought that drinking and climbing would be a good idea. But he was a good man, that guy. He'd bring us cookies and candy sometimes, and he was always there. And even though he was against the idea, the whole idea of drilling holes in the mountain, because he considered the, the face of the mountain to be holy in some way, he, <clears throat> he did acknowledge that the holes were placed there much earlier before us being here. And he had no problems with people climbing the mountain. I'm gonna show you the, uh, the other hut that he had set up. It's still there, I assume. I think the, the first one right there, you can still see it here, right there. I think that was his winter, winter residence. There was one right around the corner here. And I think if I pass that, we can head down to the temple. <laughs> 